The scripture lesson today is from the book of Romans in the New Testament, chapter 14, verses 13 through 23, and it may be found on page 153 in the Pew Bible. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. It is not good to eat meat or drink or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. The faith that you have, have as your own conviction before God. Blessed are those who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat because they do not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. The word of the Lord. Last week, we looked at how the questions and issues surrounding the addition of the Gentiles to the Jewish followers of Jesus became perhaps the largest bone of contention in the years following Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus' ministry had been limited to Israel on purpose. He's explicit about that in the Gospels. But we're told he was equally explicit about telling his followers that once he was gone, they should branch out everywhere, which they did. But it was then up to Jesus' earliest followers to figure out how to make all that work once a movement that had been confined to an area about the size of New Jersey began to spread throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. While many were part of that effort, the person with the best combination of personality, education, privilege, and experience to direct that process was Paul. It's the subtext of just about all of his letters where we learn how Paul interpreted the Torah in light of Jesus' teaching in an attempt to hold Jews and Gentiles together under one religious roof. The genius of Paul is found, I think, not in the specifics of his instructions on what to do about a particular issue, but in the broad principles he extracts from the conflict to show us how to live faithfully with those whose customs and forms of religious expression are different from our own. So this morning, I want to look at the particular conflict of eating meat sacrificed to idols and see where Paul takes both them and us. While I took his words about the issue from the letter to Rome that Joyce just read, um, it's also the subject of the entire chapter 8 in his letter to Corinth. If you remember from last week, Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church was actually a response to a letter that they sent to him asking him a bunch of questions. Chapter 8 of that letter references one of those questions with the words, now, about food sacrificed to idols. So it's going to help here if we understand that technical issue. Most Christians have a general sense of the animal sacrifice that went on in biblical times. But at least for me, 
I was so caught up in worrying about all the animals being slaughtered that it was quite a while before I realized what that system really provided. We've talked about one of those provisions before, the tithe. Jews from 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel had to bring 10% of their flocks, herds, agricultural products as an offering to the temple each year so that the 12th tribe, the tribe of Levi, could be sustained while they kept the temple up and running. So not all of the animals that were killed as sacrifices were just burned up on the altar. The Levites got 10% of the meat and agricultural offerings and then they burned 10% of what they got, so everybody's given 10% and it's all equal around the board. But it wasn't just the tribe of Levi that benefited from that system. Apart from the tithe, all the other sacrifices, the sin offerings, the thanksgiving for a new baby or whatever it happened to be, were the main way that everybody else got meat for themselves. The sacrificial system was an integral part of Israel's food supply chain. You packed up your sheep, cow, or whatever and took it to the temple for the sacrifice. A small portion was taken for the priests, but the rest went back home with you to feed your family. The same system was how the people who came to Jerusalem for the great feast days that we read about was how they got fed. The Bible tells us that at the dedication of King Solomon's temple around 960 BCE, they sacrificed 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep over a two week period. There were so many sacrifices that Solomon had to set up extra altars on the temple grounds. But that wasn't just wanton killing. It was a two week long barbecue for the thousands of people who gathered across those two weeks in, this, in that case, the celebration of this glorious new temple, or in the case of the other feast days, those celebrations. There's a reason they're called feast days. Further, the way the Israelites got their meat was far more humane than the way we do today. In fact, kosher laws for how to slaughter an animal have have limiting the suffering of the animal as a core value. The rest of us have few, if any, such laws, and meat comes to our tables today in far more horrible ways than any meat ever came to the tables of the Israelites. Every bit of their meat was locally sourced, it was humanely raised, and it was humanely slaughtered, which is an oxymoron oxymoron to some, I know. But our system of putting meat on the table is far, far worse. Most of us just don't have to see it, and so we let it go unchecked. So the first thing to understand is that eating meat that had been sacrificed was not the problem Paul was dealing with. The problem was not sacrificed meat, it was meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Well, why was that happening? Well, the system for sacrificing animals that then became your own food was not only practiced by Jews. It was such a great idea that pagan cultures did it too. Classical Greek comedies often poke fun at the fact that the Greeks tended to offer to the gods only the inedible parts of whatever they sacrificed and kept all the rest of it for themselves. For them too, the sacrificial system provided meat for individuals as well as for massive holiday celebrations for thousands of people. Jews celebrated their holy days at their temple, so did the Greeks, and so did others. So now, imagine you are in the ancient Greek city of Corinth. Corinth was an old city. It was founded in about 6500 BCE, about the same time as Jericho's walls were built. The first triremes, those Greek battleships, were built in Corinth. By the classical age, the city rivaled both Athens and Thebes in wealth and in architecture. Remember those Corinthian columns from school? <laughs> 
The cost of living was so prohibitive in Corinth that the par poet Horace wrote that, quote, not everyone is able to go to Corinth. Corinth was also known for its more than 1,000 temple prostitutes, one of whom was so famous that she has her own Wikipedia entry today. If you want to read about her, her name was Lais, L-A-I-S, painted throughout the medieval age. Greek as a language got a new word out of the city of Corinth. Corinthiazisthai, to live like a Corinthian, meant to live a life of wealthy, drunken debauchery. To live up to that reputation required lavish feasts, and lavish feasts, not to mention thousands of ladies in the pagan temples that needed to eat too, meant lots of animal sacrifices to provide the entrees for all of that feasting. Throw in a very wealthy city with individuals who wanted to host lots of guests in their homes. Make your sacrifice to whichever god you'd prefer, leave the inedible parts at the temple, and then bring the rest home for your guests. And to muddy the waters even further, if you were wealthy and could afford to have meat whenever you wanted, you might make some sacrifices just to then sell the meat to the local market. Support the temple and make money for yourself at the same time, win-win. Jews living in Corinth could hardly go to Jerusalem every time they wanted meat. But buying meat at the market was dicey because they had no idea where the meat came from. They needed very strict sourcing, a Jewish butcher they could trust, and so on. Well, the problem got a lot bigger for Jews in the diaspora once you started mingling Jews and Gentiles in the churches Paul established. Remember that before Christians were being thrown to the lions, the early churches melt, met in the homes of wealthy patrons. And the central event of that house church meeting was a full meal where people brought food to share, a potluck, if you will. Those meals were the first form of what we celebrate now as Holy Communion. It was a very literal feast. It wasn't until persecution forced Christians to start meeting in secret in the catacombs that the meal had to turn into just this tiny token piece of bread and a sip of wine passed around that you could hide from anybody who was looking. It was just a tiny reminder of the grand feast of fellowship that was and that they hoped and prayed would be someday again. We, actu we actually have communion as it was originally set up every Sunday. It's called coffee hour. <laughs> I'm serious. Since, since I need, and since I need to avoid gluten, I go into coffee hour each week wondering if there's gonna be something there that I can eat. And that's not so far off from what Jewish followers of Jesus had to ask when they went to church in the home of a Greek patron or visited over a meal at another time. Except, of course, the stakes for them were much higher. Where did this meat come from? If it came from a market, the patron might not even know. Well, you say, certainly they could just tell everyone to make sure the meat came from a kosher butcher, right? You could, but remember from last week and the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 that they created separate rules for, Jew for Jews and Gentiles, including relaxing a lot of the dietary laws. Both groups were told to refrain from things, quote, polluted by idols. But what did that mean? What if someone brought meat that came from a pagan sacrifice? If they just picked it up at the market, no one would even know. And some reasoned that if idols aren't really gods at all, meat from a sacrifice to a piece of stone or wood couldn't really pollute anything, could it? Gentile believers likely saw no point in even worrying about it especially since they could have family consequences for giving up the pagan feast days if everybody else in their family still gathered at the temple for those celebrations. It would be like us refusing to show up for Thanksgiving 
or Christmas. And both Gentile and Jewish merchants could lose important connections by issues surrounding the sourcing of food. Those of you in business, think about how many deals and how much networking is done over food. Think of what's just been lost in the years over COVID when we could not eat together. They were already giving up a lot to follow Jesus. Did this really matter? Since the Corinthians went to considerable trouble to write Paul about it, clearly they had people with strong feelings on both sides of the issue. Paul's initial response is in 1 Corinthians 8. But the problem with sourcing meat was bigger than Corinth. And so when Paul is composing his letter to the church in Rome, which was, remember, essentially his grant proposal to get the church that Peter founded in Rome to support a ministry he wanted to do in Spain, Paul thinks the problem through more thoroughly to write it out for the Romans. What's really at issue here? Is there a way to be faithful followers of Torah and Christ together? And Paul's answer is classic. He responds in essence, it's not about you. It also isn't about the meat. And it's not even about the idols. It's about your relationship with other believers. If what you are doing, even if it is perfectly correct, is shaking the faith of someone else, then either keep it to yourself so they don't know, or if that's not possible, don't do it at all. Paul acknowledges that those who have more mature faith are not harmed by eating meat sacrificed to idols. Paul's not on a rant here saying, do not eat meat sacrificed to idols. He acknowledges, yeah, you're right. Those are not real gods and there, there's no real spiritual consequences from God. Um, if there's no heinous sin by eating meat sacrificed to Apollo, even if you chow down in front of his statue at the temple and at a feast at, in his honor, because Apollo is not real. So no harm, no foul. However, if someone whose faith is less mature than yours is misunderstanding your actions and losing their faith by seeing you feasting in Apollo's temple, then that's the real problem. The sin is not in eating meat. The sin is in harming the faith of another in your community. In Romans chapter 14, verse 15, Paul says, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. In verse 21, he advises, it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. The responsibility of the more mature is to nurture and to help the less mature. It's the strong who should help the weak. It's the privileged who should help the oppressed. It's the rich who should help the poor. It's the most important person who should accept the place of the least. But there's another part of Paul's advice. The meat eaters might argue, but how's somebody's faith harmed by what I'm doing? Especially if you, Paul, are telling me there's nothing, that we're right and there's nothing really wrong with it. Can't we just explain that? Um, and Paul's answer to that is more nuanced. In the last line of Romans 14, Paul says, whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. If you want to chew on something, chew on that for, for a week. Um, what Paul is saying here is that sin in God's eyes is actually a matter of the heart. If in my heart I believe that something is wrong 
and then do it anyway, I've sinned. Because what God wants is a heart that's always trying at least to do the right thing, even if we fail. A heart that's thinking, this is wrong, but he's doing it, so I guess I'll do it too, is sin. Even if there's nothing technically wrong with what the other guy is doing, because you're thinking, this is a wrong thing, but I'm going along with the crowd. And to get at Paul's point, I want to leave you with a story from my life as a case study. Then at communion or coffee hour, you can talk over what you think was right or wrong about it. Or not, you can just eat. <laughs> but it was January of 1979. I was 19 years old and sitting in the home of an elderly couple in the Bavarian Alps. I had stayed in Germany after a college music tour to do some extra visiting around with a friend whose uncle lived in Germany and who was willing to put the two of us up for an extra week. Her uncle then proceeded to take us around both to see the sights and to meet family members that my friend had never met before. And so we sat with these two members of her extended family. It was my friend, Deb, me, Deb's uncle, and the cousin, and the couple. Although as a German major, my German was pretty good, the dialect in rural Alpine communities was tough for me to decipher. But clearly we were welcomed, and they brought out food and drink for us to share. It was the drink it was the problem. I was raised in a pretty strict household and a very strict household when it came to alcohol. There was no alcohol in our home. I never saw my parents drink in their entire lives. My mother wouldn't even buy a raffle ticket from her students at school if one of the prizes was a liquor basket. As a Baptist, communion had grape juice as we do here. In fact, even at age 19, the only alcohol that had ever crossed my lips was when my baptismal class visited an Episcopal church and we took communion there. <laughs> Nobody prepared me for the fact that that was going to be wine, but that is another story. <laughs> my point here is that sitting there in the Alps with this couple, I was a no on any and all alcohol. And alcohol was what this couple was offering me. I tried to explain that I couldn't drink it, but I could not make myself understood. And they kept offering me different kinds of alcohol. And I refused every time. I believed it was sin. I would not take it. I've gotten over this, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, when we got back to Deb's uncle's house, he explained that I had deeply offended the couple with my refusal. They interpreted my refusal as saying that what they were offering was not good enough. And the repeated offers was them going to get better stuff and the better stuff until they were giving me the best stuff they had in the house and still Anne said, Nope. They felt humiliated as hosts, and I was horrified to learn of the harm that I had caused them. In my mid-twenties, I told that story to a man in my church in Maryland, referencing Romans 14 to say that, you know, now I thought I should have accepted the drink and at least pretended to take a sip so that I wouldn't offend their hospitality. He said, nope, I'd done the right thing, based on the same chapter in Romans 14, because if I believed it was sinful to drink, then it would be so for me, even if it wasn't for anybody else. So I will leave you to mull over my dilemma. But whether I did the right thing or the wrong thing in that situation, Paul's point from this morning's passage is, I think, the correct one. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister.
I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Amen.